misikitiko kwa wananchi wa Kenya kwa maafa ambayo yamefanyika siku ya leo kuletwa vita kwetu sisi watu wenye amani hatujui ni kwa nini Kenya is no stranger to terror attacks, most of which have been carried on its own soil by extremists linked to Al-Qaeda. Twenty years ago, on 7th August, on this very park, at 10.30 a.m., it became a rubble after suicide bombers in trucks rammed the U.S. Embassy. Although this terror attack was aimed at a U.S. facility, most of its victims were Kenyan citizens. More than 200 people lost their lives and 5,000 more would be wounded and would leave their lives with scars. I'm Dr. Masi Korir and Health Digest remembers the survivors of this terror attack. My name is Douglas Sidialo, a known blind adventurer, and I'm now 48 years old. My name is Abraham Odo Um I'm currently the CEO of a firm called Miradi Capital. August 7th, 1998 was a bright Friday morning and I was on my way to work along Halisalasia Avenue. So as I came down from Uhuru Highway down to Halisalasia, the traffic was quite packed. So vehicles were moving at a snail's pace. So we came down towards X Telecoms to cooperative house building. Then I saw this truck that took a turn and went towards the American Embassy gates. Then I witnessed an altercation between the occupants of the truck and the security personnel from the Embassy side. And then I heard what I thought were gunshots, three of them being thrown at the Embassy. And what came to mind were that these were gangsters who wanted to rob the embassy, but it never occurred to me that they, they were actually terrorists. Then I saw a man run from the scene of the shooting towards the heavy traffic where we were, and that's when a huge blast went. working for Cooperative Merchant Bank. Cooperative Merchant Bank was a fully owned subsidiary of Cooperative Bank. <clears throat> and it was housed at a foodie house as, as opposed to the main uh, Cooperative Bank house. So that morning I just reported to work as normal. On a Friday in the morning I was off duty and I was at home. So sometimes later I decided to come to town. So I was coming into town by uh, public means. And so I was curious to see what is happening towards town. And everybody's face was towards town. And you can see buildings when you are along the road. You can see buildings like Kenya Cooperative Bank. You could see it from Jogo Road. And so everybody was curious to see what is happening in town. 
So we drove and drove, and as we were moving towards City Stadium, more and more people were now jamming the road. And so I think the driver realized something, and he saw a huge smoke, and he just made a U-turn at the roundabout of the City Stadium. <laughs> And so we were heading back again towards Islam. And the only thing he said in Kiswahili was Kumedoka in Sheng. So he turned around and he was coming towards Jogo Road again. So being curious of what was happening as a journalist, I stopped at uh, Likoni Road and told him, no, Mimi, you have to drop me here. I'm not going back to the estate. So that time our officers were at Likoni Road. And so I dropped and walked to the Likoni Road. When I reached Likoni Road, my boss, who was, um, who was called uh, Peter Wellam, saw me and he just said, yes, it's good you're here. So I was like, what is happening? And he told me there is something serious. We don't know what is happening, but you have to find out. First of all, I'm trying to find out how you can move to town. But in the meantime, climb up the building and, and, and try to see what is happening in town there. So when I climbed out the building, there was smoke, but I could not see what was happening. And so when I came down to see him, he told me, you are going to town now. And by all means, you have to be in town. So we picked the cameras that were in the office. And he told me, I'm getting for you a driver. You drive first of all to Wilson Airport. And so because you cannot reach town now, and you have to reach out. It was around 10, 10.30, 10.30 or thereabout. The, um, there was an initial very loud bang. And uh, I remember asking my colleague, Dominic, who passed on, um, what that was. And so, because you know our offices were just called next to each other. So he told me, why don't you go and find out? So I left the office, I left my cubicle, and was headed towards the door. The door facing uh, NHC house. So when I got to the door, is when the actual blast, proper blast now happened. And with that, I was flung out. I, I say that because when I got by, I, I was somewhere near where there is the task is now. From that day, I have never witnessed light of day again. I became blind. I think the impact of the devastating blast could have been the cause of my eye loss. The shrapnels, the fire, the dust, and also when I was rescued and taken to Kenyatta National Referral Hospital, the doctors were overwhelmed with the number of patients there because it was the first time in Kenyan history such a terrible and heinous and barbaric act of cowardice had happened. So the manpower at the hospital was less equipped to handle the number of patients that were there. So it could have taken them a little longer to attend to us. And as a result, most of us, including myself, received the blunt of that um, time that was lost before we are treated. Lucky for me, one of my colleagues is in the bank now, he's called Lydia Rono. She took me to hospital. I was one of the first people to get to Nairobi Hospital. And I was taken in that my condition was critical. I learned that later. 
But I remember in the car, we were three people uh, bleeding very badly. But we were, <clears throat> but we all got to hospital. So I think my luck was that I got to hospital in time. So we went with my boss who was called Yaya Mohammed. We went to Wilson Airport. Uh, there was a, a, a pilot there and a chopper. So we were told to, to, to be in town. So we came to town and reaching town there was huge smoke at the roundabout of uh, cooperative bank and the buildings that were around there, all of them were smashed, the, all the windows were down and a lot of crazy things here and there. There were people lying on the roads and some people were dead, bodies were all over and so we landed down at the roundabout of the cooperative bank, cooperative roundabout there. And as we were taking pictures, so we wanted to find out exactly how it happened. That is the time we came to realize it was a bomb at the, at the embassy. I was in somewhat kneeling down and praying. Because the impact was so much devastating, so powerful, in such a way that I just became unconscious. But what I only remember is that I was somehow was somewhat kneeling and praying and I was rescued from the scene and taken to Kenyatta National Referral Hospital. It's only a God who knows. Because my face was all but in darkness. My eyes were just in darkness. So everything around me was just but darkness. I sustained a lot of injuries. Um, I had a lot of... Luckily for me, the, the only fracture I had was on my skull, somewhere up here. But the rest of it were deep flesh wounds. And uh, I underwent a lot of surgeries. I was in hospital for almost a month. The colleagues who did not move, most of them perished. Because we were, at that time, we were only 15 in the office. Some were in meetings, some were away, some were on leave. Out of those 15, only five survived. The other 10 finished. Uh, out of those uh, five, I think it's only me and Dennis who are out of the rubble. The, the other three were, were in the rubble and they had to get out. What, what we saw was terrible. Several buildings were down. Two of them actually were down. The embassy, part of the embassy and the Ufundi house were all down. And people were struggling to to retrieve bodies who were, that were, were stuck inside the rubbles. So Kenyans were out to help. And it was bloody. Everybody was, was crying. Guys were crying and, and there were people who were offering vehicles to take uh, the injured to hospital. It was all bloody everywhere and confusion, a lot of confusion around. This was the Minister of Education, Joseph Kamoth. Well, at that, at that moment, you know, journalistic ideas, instinct were first and foremost just to, to get clear in terms of recording, just to record the best things that, how it was happening. So at that particular time, there was just the idea, journalistic idea of just getting the best pictures out of it. And so we did several pictures, a lot of pictures, both aerial and, and ground photos. What became apparent is that everybody wanted to know what had really happened th that day. So I took it upon myself to, to tell you, tell them what I'm telling you now. In the, as much as I could remember and I was, as much as I was injured. But you see that time, we didn't even know what terrorism was. So even, we just knew it was a bomb, but not the terror angle. I think that came later. But by that time, you just knew that there was a bomb targeted at the American embassy. And we, were, we, 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 we got hit as well. When I was at Kenyatta, both Kenyan doctors and German surgeons who have flown in to help uh, save our site tried their best but without success. So, two months later, I was discharged. 
And the doctor told me when I was uh, being discharged that Douglas, after six months, you'll regain your sight. But then, when I went back home, I realized that there was something a bit unusual about my eyes. Because it took a little longer for the bandages to have been received, removed. But I think my wife, when she was going through the hospital documents, she discovered that my left eye was totally eviscerated and the retina of my right eye was totally damaged. That meant I was but completely blind. So whatever the doctor was telling me that I'll be able to see after six months, I've been waiting for this miracle to happen for the last 20 years. What was interesting was that I, the log show I arrived there around 10, 30, 10, 40. But my first recollection of seeing, because the past people I saw were my family, my mother and father, who were the first people who went to my room, because I was, I'd, I'd gone in a private room, thank God. It was already dark. So that means that almost a whole day had passed. But what I know, what I, can, what I can tell you, is that during that period, I had uh, the two things. One, what they say, life flashing before you. You see your life on a screen. You see yesterday, you see five years ago. You see last week, you see, and, and it goes on like that. So those things are true. Then there's the issue of going towards the light. You go start moving, then I said no. So you start bargaining, you bargain and say, I said, I said no, my son is only one year. That time he was only one, now he's 21. I said, no, I can't leave him. So when you say that and you bargain, then you start coming back. So those things they say about light and flashing are true. I personally experienced them. I cannot prove them, but I know I did that. But when I came by, to a point when I came by, I was not sure which side of life I was on. Uh, a very long piece of glass that had gone through up to my lung. My one lung had already collapsed. And, and, and I was taken to surgery immediately. These are things I came to learn later. You know, when I inquired what really went on, and I, what I was also told was that I was, I was resuscitated three or four times. And no wonder those things of going and coming back. So I, I was able to piece, because I really wanted to know what was going went on. And many more bizarre things that I would not want to say here. <laughs> but the, the issue is, um, if if I had not, or if I had gone to a hospital without the kind of care that hospital has, I would definitely not have made it, without a doubt. Me and my colleague Dennis, because of the kind of critical care we, we, we needed. You were the first ones at the hospital. Yeah, we were the first ones. We actually we arrived together. He was next year, and I was here. But him was worse because they were they were debating whether to take him to the morgue or to, or, or, or take him in. The, their reaction on their face clearly showed me how injured I was because I had not seen a mirror. And the doctors were telling me that I don't have one eye. So I think this side must have been very badly done. So I'm telling them I can see it twice, they said no. One eye is missing. So my mother, father, they came, looked at me. They didn't say much. They were just relieved I was alive. And they left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I was there. I was there. So, but one thing I must say, um, it's, very, it's very, very, is it ironic or... Twenty years ago, my father and mother would come to hospital in the morning and stay bedside until evening. Only take a break of a lunchtime when people are coming for the entire period. You know, so it's why I say it's like like now my dad is unwell. Now it's my turn to do the same thing. Twenty years down the line, you see. So, but that was something because every time I would wake up, they would be, they'd be there. When I discovered that I had lost sight, I was very much devastated. I was very bitter. I was very angry. In fact, I imagined that if I, I would have met the men behind that barbaric and heinous act of cowardice, I would have skinned them alive, little by little, slowly by slowly, so that they could feel the pain and the experience 
we are going through as victims of that disaster. But down the line, I realized that bitterness and anger only but retards healing. So I started picking up the pieces and have been moving on with my life through courage, determination, and profound confidence through my rehabilitation journey, sports, and adventure pursuits. Uh, there's the why me, what did you survive and then they died? Because uh, I, I don't think they were any better or any worse than I am. That's number one. Number two, there's a feeling that what could they have been now? Because those are colleagues who you who who you woke up, shared a, shared tea with, and they just died. So you, but you, what you get is a sense of appreciation of life that you have been given a second chance. So for me, I look at it as my second life, 20 years in a few days from now. And you live life more purposely, purposefully, and live life like it's your last, because those guys did not know that they had a few hours to go. Because we were even making plans for Friday evening to go watch a movie as a group. You see, and they, they didn't make it, you know, so. But it, 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 the, it, for me, it brought home the reality of death and how final it is. Those guys went and they went and they've not come back and they're not going to come back. So for me, it's live your life, live your life as, it's, as if it's your last and do what you can do today and not tomorrow because tomorrow you have no control of tomorrow. Yeah. Still to come on Health Digest. They come back to us after years. You don't want to be in a place where you cannot see an exit. And that, that's with me up to today. This is KTN News.